Church, let's give Jesus praise this morning. Amen. Well, as you remain standing, just want to welcome everybody that's tuning in with us this morning, all our Facebook and YouTube viewers. We're so glad you decided to join us. And then a special welcome to our Paul 96.7 FM listeners that are with us this morning on radio. And we're trusting wherever you're watching from or listening from that the Word of God, the presence of God will manifest right there where you are. So come on, everybody in the room. Let's just welcome everybody with us this morning. And then before you take your seat, just greet someone, greet a neighbor, smile, be friendly. I know it is hot again today. Maar jullie kan niet klaar hitte in die kerkie. Wat ik zie van jullie, daar bij die cricket. Ik zie jullie. Ik zie jullie daar. In die warm zon. Nee? Amen. Lekker cool in die kerk, man. Amen. Are you well? Good to see you this morning. Amen. Who is visiting us for the very first time? Can I just see the show of hands who's visiting us for the very first time? Come on. Let's just welcome all our first time visitors. So glad you're here with us this morning. We trust this morning that you're going to see the rumor is true. CRC is indeed the place to be. Amen. And so uh, we're in a series and we're continuing with part three this morning of our series living in overflow and so over the past two weeks we looked at week one as to what is the purpose the reason and the plan for which God created us because if we don't have an understanding of God's plan and God's purpose how is it possible that we can understand the purpose for which we were created and so we saw that the Bible says that God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply subdue the earth and have dominion and basically what that line says, that instruction, be fruitful and multiply, means it means fill the earth with offspring. Amen. It means procreate. It means advance the species with image bearers of God. That's why God said it's not good for man to be alone. That's why God said it's good for a husband to find a wife because he finds a good thing. And then the Bible says in the context and the confines of marriage, we are supposed to procreate, have children. And so some of you might have been offended with me. I'm only quoting research when I say, when funny friends have over my person, give on gekyk. Amen. To ek nou gesê, dit is a probleem om net een kind te hee. There's many reasons why people only have one children. Let me, let me, maybe qualify the statement I'm only quoting what research says and why it's better to have more than one child for the family dynamic for a child's social development etc 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 evil I understand that there's there's maybe health reasons and other concerns etc 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 I'm just quoting what studies are saying amen and so husbands I'm trying to help you here amen to go for number two. Dalk moet jy gaan vir die vaste vijf. Wie weet. Amen. Van jylle het by die voorraai gestop. Dalk hoop jy hier of jou twee slotte by te sit. Amen. Let me move on. I'm still getting stairs. Anyway. But, your ultimate purpose is, is to fill the earth. Amen. With image bearers of God. And so, it's also a very strategic thing and a strategic plan of God that if Christians can't outnumber the rest of the world, then God's people will rule the world. Amen? Anyway. Then last week we looked at the life of Joshua to whom this plan and this purpose was handed down to. And Joshua at the Jordan was given this instruction by God to lead this people into the promised land. And we see God say to Joshua, only be strong and courageous telling you and me the reader that obviously God's saying something to him because this assignment this plan that Joshua had to fulfill obviously caused anxiety and fear and uncertainty in him and God says be strong and courageous and so we established that in order for you to fulfill your purpose in life 
you are going to be confronted and faced with things that are going to call you, cause you fear. But strength and courage are only required in atmospheres of fear, which says to you and me that God leads us into places that might make us anxious, uncertain, and fearful. And for you to fulfill your purpose would require you to step into things that maybe make you afraid, that maybe you fear, that maybe you have doubts in. And the very thing that you might be avoiding is the very thing that God might be calling you into. And so fulfilling our purpose will require us to face our fears and step into things that God has prepared for us. Amen. And so you're ready for part three this morning. It's a topic I want to speak on because it's a topic that literally changed and saved and elevated my life as a young Christian. I view it second only to my salvation and my baptism in terms of scriptural or biblical or faith principles that altered the course of my life. So obviously I was saved and I was filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in water. And those things set me on a course to fulfill God's plan for my life. But this subject, this topic, this principle really is the principle that elevated and launched me into the life that God had prepared for me. Now, one of my great joys as a pastor is I, I read many books and I listen to podcasts and some of the things they say are very interesting and I find them very informative. But one of the joys I have in reading, listening to podcasts is to determine whether what I'm reading or what these people say have a biblical basis. Does the Bible affirm, reaffirm, confirm or align to what studies in science, psychology, archaeology, history, whatever, if it proves the Bible. I get giddy about it. That's why I enjoy preparing sermons and studying for a word. Amen. Might not excite you. Gets me all up very excited. Amen. And so the subject of the mind has always intrigued me ever since as a young Christian. I read books like Renewing the Mind by Casey Treat and the book The Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer and those books left a lasting impression on me. And these books open up a whole world of possibilities before me as I discovered that if I can change my mind, I can change my life. I never knew that. For the bulk of my life up until that point, nobody had ever told me that. I never knew it. I never had the revelation of if I could change my mind, I could change my life. And that's the premise of this morning's message. This is if you, no matter where you are in life, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your background, if you this morning can choose to change your mind, you can change your life. So look what the, let's look at what the Bible says about this. Our scripture verse is Ephesians 3. And it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so this is a powerful passage of scripture that says to you and I that God is able to do limitless things in the life of of a person that believes in him and his word a person that has a renewed mind as a result of the presence of God in their life God would not say to us that he could do those things in the life of a person that allows his power to work in and through us if it wasn't true and so Romans 12 verse 2 it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God will not ask you or instruct you to renew your mind if it was not possible. 
And it applies to all people in all seasons of life. Because you might have achieved great things in your studies, but now you have to build a great career. You might have built a great career and you feel the stirring of going into business. Now you have to build a great business. You might have proven yourself to be the person who can find a husband and a wife and get married, but now you have to build a great marriage. Amen. And all those things only happened in the life of the person who is continuously renewing their mind about their life, about their career, about their business, about their marriage, about their family. You have to constantly renew your mind. The Bible says and instructs us that we do that by meditating upon the Word. By being in God's presence, by being in His Spirit, are we able to renew our minds? And then the Bible says, we prove indeed that God is real and what He says is true. Amen? Are you still with me? Now this is the scripture that changed it all for me. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I had, a biblical, I had biblical evidence that proved to me that if I renew my mind, I can live a renewed life. And at first I thought I understood the scripture. But as I delved deeper into it, I realized there's a lot more going on here that meets the eye. And so let's delve a little bit into it from a scientific or psychological basis and let's see where it leads us. Your mind is not your brain. Your brain does not produce your mind. Your mind is what changes or alters your brain. Now stay with me because I'm leading a laying a foundation so that we can see that there's a biblical foundation for this. Your mind basically consists of thinking, feeling, and choosing. It is represented in your brain as energy. And as you think, feel, and choose, you build thoughts. And those thoughts are then actual physical structures in the brain. And so your thoughts and your feelings and your actions, or what you choose, can change the physical structure of your brain. And this is what's known as neuroplasticity. Your brain is constantly changing and building structures of thoughts as a result of what's happening in your mind. And as you renew your mind, you are renewing your brain, which in turn renews your life. All of us here, from the time we were born, from the time that we could think, and reason, and choose, and act, we're forming our brains, which determined the course of our lives. Now, if that was true from the beginning, and all these structures are able to form in a thinking person, and an acting person, and a feeling person, then surely it should be true that as we go about life, we are able to change or reverse those things. Amen? Because your brain is neuroplastic. It has the ability to shift and change and form new pathways and new structures that lead to a new life. In the Greek, the mind is described as the following. The God-given capacity of each person to think or reason. The mental capacity to exercise reflective thinking. And for the believer, it is the organ of receiving God's thoughts through faith. The mind. Your mind consists of the functions of perceiving, understanding, judging, determining, reasoning, and intellect. So your life right now, as it is, 
is a physical representation of what is going on in your mind. And let me say this before we move on. If you don't accept full responsibility for the state of your life as it is now, you can never renew your mind. Because you'll always be stuck in the past. What happened to you? What someone did? Circumstances beyond your control. And maybe you never asked for those things to happen. Maybe you weren't the cause of those things. That's the truth and that's a reality. But the most important reality is that if you want to change your life, you have to accept full responsibility for where you are. Amen. And so we have to consider the things in the light of what's going on in our own country. Because the mistakes of our past have created generations of very dependent people. Amen. And so we have a responsibility as a government and as a nation, as a people, to right the wrongs of the past. But what we are doing as well in the same time is creating a dependency, which is the breeding ground for all kinds of Marxist ideologies, etc., by which the state controls the people. And the only thing and only person that you want to be dependent on is God. And so, the history of our country might have caused you to be in the state that you are, or the life that you're living, or where you're living. That was not of your choosing, I do understand. And we as a church take up that responsibility to help people in need. But we also have a responsibility to tell people to take responsibility for your life and to say, by the grace of God, by the word of God, by the spirit of God, by the power of God, I am going to accept responsibility for my life. I'm going to renew my mind and I'm going to build the life I know that God has called me to. Amen. You don't build a great life with a need-minded mentality. Everybody must always constantly come to your aid. and You're dependent on handouts and other people. There's a season for that, that we do help people. The Bible tells us that. But then in that season, we cultivate habits and abilities that allow us to overcome those things. Amen. A field of study that supports this truth is the study of mindset. Experts always believed that people were endowed with abilities, traits, intellect, capacities, and qualities that were unique to each individual and that those things were set and unchangeable. In years gone by, you might not have been aware of it, but it was in case the fact and true, classrooms were divided according to IQ. From the smartest to the not so smart. Believing that smart children will always be smarter and that those on the lower end of the IQ spectrum were not able to change or improve. Do you recall doing IQ tests in school? Did you do IQ tests at school? Was it not my generation? And what the school systems did back in those days is they arranged the class according to the lowest to the highest IQ. That's why certain pupils always sat in certain places. Amen. Wie het altijd heel achter gesit? 
Moet niet nou je laan opsteek nie. Maar as een rede, hoe kom jy heel achter gesit het, ne? Maar hy rede was een leen. But the inventor of the IQ test, Alfred Bernay, did not formulate the test as a means to separate the sheep from the goats, as it would be. His whole purpose for the test was to prove that intelligence is not a fixed quantity and that with practice, training and the right methodologies, children indeed can become more intelligent. And so what he wanted to prove by the test is that yes, there are certain children with higher IQs than others, but his idea was to remove these children from the same setting that had lower IQs and invest in them and teach them certain methodologies and abilities and practices that proved that lower IQ children could indeed improve their IQ. What we always thought to be true wasn't true. These things weren't set. But we had whole generations of children and people that became grown-ups believing that my abilities are set based upon a test and what someone said about me. It won't amount to nothing. Amen. Dr. Caroline Dweck, a leading researcher and professor of psychology, stumbled upon this idea of mindset in a research study of hers to understand how people cope with failure. She did this by studying and observing how children deal with problems. And what she found astounded her and changed everything she thought she had learned. She presented the children with puzzles, starting with ones that were fairly simple and increasing the difficulty of the puzzles with each round. What she found when presenting these children with challenging puzzles was not what she expected. Each child, as they faced the ever-increasing complexity of the challenges, were not deterred by the difficulty and their subsequent errors, but they were energized and excited through each failure. She thought in her mind, we either coped with failure or we didn't. It's a capacity or an ability that she thought was set in human beings. You either had the ability to deal with failure or you did not have the ability to deal with failure. And so these children proved her wrong children were between the ages of 9 and 11 and she discovered in them that they were not discouraged by failure but in actual fact did not think they were failing at all they thought they were learning this launched her groundbreaking research into the area of mindsets and what she discovered now I'm giving I'm breaking it down very basic simplistic language here, amen. If you want to know more, you can go study her work. It's available on the internet. She's written books, etc. But she found two predominating mindsets. A fixed mindset, which is people believe qualities are set and it creates in them an urgency to constantly prove themselves. Or a growth mindset. People believe that their qualities can be cultivated through effort, strategy, and assistance. Now here's the thing, the perspective you have about yourself determines how you live your life. Now that perspective might have been shaped by people in authority, teachers, parents, grandparents, whatever the case might be, but you have a perspective of yourself and the perspective you have of yourself determines how you live your life. There it comes that responsibility thing again. I'm responsible for my life. Amen. Say to someone this morning, I am responsible for my life. You've got to hear yourself say it. You are responsible. I am responsible for my life. Because you know what? If you don't take up responsibility for your life, someone else will assume authority over your life and you will always be who they tell you you are 
you need to assume responsibility. Because the perspective you have about yourself determines how you live your life. Your life is a picture of who you believe yourself to be. Amen. Now here's some interesting things they found in these studies. A fixed mindset person who is told they're smart accepts that and sets out to prove only how smart they are. They set out to prove their giftedness, but they never commit to growth and testing their boundaries for fear of not looking smart, intelligent, or gifted. Think about that. You could come out of university as the smartest student in your class. And because you do not commit to a growth mindset, you will settle at that and never build a great life, even though you might have been very good academically. Because you were told you were smart and it was enough for you to prove that. And now all you do in life is try and prove how smart you are, but you never grow in life. She studied cases of children that were the most gifted in certain areas of their, of their class and in their school. But as soon as these children or these students were confronted with the idea of testing themselves beyond their schools against other smart children, they withdrew for fear that they might be exposed and not be as smart as people told them they were. It was enough to be the smartest in the class. It was enough to be the smartest in the school. But I feared if I ventured out there and tested myself against others, I might not be the smart one. Amen. Intelligence is not a guarantee to success. It's a great start. Growth mindset person adopts a perspective about themselves that says their capacity is not set, that potential is unknown, and that anything can be achieved if a person is willing to learn, grow, and endure challenges. What did I say to us last year? Do hard things. I discovered another area of research that I only discovered after I'd completed my sermon, but I'll try and get to it at the end. That floored my mind. Just proving the word of God again. But a fixed mindset person says, nothing ventured, nothing lost. A growth mindset says, nothing ventured, nothing gained. A fixed mindset person says, if at first I don't succeed, I probably didn't have the ability. Growth mindset person says, if at first I don't succeed, I try and try again. Which person are you this morning? Or which person would you like to aspire to be? The fixed mindset person is concerned with how you will be judged. The growth mindset person is concerned with improving. Are we not a people that go from glory to glory? A person with growth mindset might be devastated by failure, but they're never defined by it. It's a challenge, it's a challenge that can be overcome in their minds if you would face it and learn from it. My greatest fear in planting this church was that I would not be good enough and that I would fail. In my years in Cape Town, I was always told what a great pastor I was and how good I was with people. And I was able to build home cells and structures and zones. And I loved being that person. Who people looked up to because of my pastoral abilities. Love being affirmed for that, being recognized for that. And when the call came to come and plant this church, in came the fixed mindset. This is a massive risk. 
because you might fail. And this image that you've built up over years and years and years might be destroyed because you would fail. My mindset was fixed in that I'd rather not be a failure and risk damaging my image that I'd worked so hard to cultivate than taking a risk to fulfill my purpose. A lot of people with a lot of ability, but they have a fixed mindset for fear of what they might be perceived as. The very idea of risking my reputation, my security, my position, because I might fail. They'd rather not fail than see what they can achieve. And here's the reality. It has been a series for me in pastoring a church of failures, of poor judgment, of wrong choices, of unforeseen circumstances that has brought me to this point. Amen. Am I speaking to someone this morning? Are you seeing some of the things in your life and in your heart and in your mind? And that was a wake-up call to me that I'd rather not risk failure than pursue my purpose for fear of destroying my image or failing. Many good, bright people live there. They have all the ability, all the capacity to do great things in life, but fear of failure prevents them from taking a step. And so my mindset now is not one of wanting to fail, but seeing every failure as necessary in the process of me fulfilling my purpose. If you are a person who fears failure, you value self-preservation above self-actualization. But this dive word. Self actualization, if you go look on Maslow's chart, is reaching the highest form of yourself. And you can attain that. But because of a fixed mindset, you value self preservation more than you value becoming all you can be. Because maybe around you there's many examples of people who have failed. And you hear the discussions about them. And the things that their families might go through. People losing out and people having to start over. And that very fear just keeps replaying over and over. And you'll settle for a life that you know, that you know, that you know is not fulfilling Amen. 1 Corinthians 2, 16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Think of that. By the Holy Spirit, we have been endowed with the mind of Christ. It's my belief that if Christians should be at the forefront of science and technology, of arts and business and inventions and medicine, because we always have been, in this room should be captains of industry, people who do great things in the world that change the world, that change this community, that change as a family. Christians have always done that throughout the ages. Think of Mozart and Edison, Newton and Einstein, Bell, Da Vinci, Pascal, Nightingale, were all Christians or heavily influenced by Christianity. And they changed the world. We're living in a world that values comfort and security above the exploits of what is possible. Most people 
that they've interviewed on their deathbed. Had three to five similar things that they said. And one of the things they said at the end that they're disappointed in is that they didn't take more risk. Amen. Each of these people I mentioned here possessed a growth mindset, pushed the boundaries of what could be achieved by a person who utilizes their God-given potential in pursuit of the unknown. Colossians 3.2 says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Where's your mindset? If we set our minds on heaven's call and God's eternal purpose, then there's no limit to what we can achieve in this world. What is your mind set upon? Are you set maybe on your own family's failures and adopted that mindset that says because they failed, because my father failed, because my mother failed, because my grandfather failed, I'm going to fail. Many people live with that mindset. You wouldn't know it, but they do. I had that mindset because no one in my family had ever, ever really achieved anything of significance. I don't say that arrogantly. I just didn't have a good example of success and achieving certain heights. And so my mindset was always limiting. Amen. As you met me for Ochem, as you let you still want you dunk. Is it helping someone this morning? Just because they failed, just because your father failed or your grandfather failed or your mother failed, doesn't mean you're going to fail. Amen. There's no shame in failure. There's no shame in failure. The only shame is in not trying and in giving up. I'd rather have my children raised by a father who tried his best, risked failure and reputation in pursuit of God than have them grow up in an environment where I play it safe and they're never inspired to push the boundaries of their limitations. We can send our children. Are we in that phase now? Where are we sending our kids to try things that they might like in sport, etc., etc.? And we can expose them to those things and they can experience those things and maybe gain a joy or a liking or a passion for those things. But ultimately, what they pursue in life. What they become in life is mirrored by the father and the mother. And you carry that spirit with you whether you know it or not. Your children will adore you and love you and think you're the greatest thing on earth. But if you carry a self-preservation fixed mindset, that is what you model without you even knowing it. Amen. Amen. It's a reality that scares me in a good way because it challenges me who I am. Amen. Here's an interesting fact that I learned through all my reading and studying. Did you know that a child's physical exercise ability is determined by the mother. Ooh. How active the mother is will determine how active the child is. What? Say, Pastor, no. I just about fell out of my chair. Now, funny little man's thing yesterday, I had a virgin active contract, as you know me, as you know me, Sit you down off your bunk. Go, Leafy, go. Can I skate? Amen. 
just things I'm learning. Amen. <laughs> oh, funny to surf that now. Oh, one sec. Mothers, do with it what you want. Amen. I'll still be in the gym suffering as some of you see me suffering. Amen. I know it looks terrible, but I'm trying. Amen. Prophesy. Because we always think these things rest only on the Father. Because the Bible says He's the authority figure, man is the head of the household, etc., etc. All those things. The fathers have their responsibilities. But mothers, you have a role to play. Amen. And so, I want to create environments where people are inspired to have growth mindsets. Amen. I want to be a person, a pastor, a father, a husband that inspires in people a growth mindset. Because the world needs that right now especially. One of my favorite secular songs by Bank One Republic it's called I Lived. Ever listen to that song? Oh, Anyway, the singer and the writer of that song is a Christian. Okay? And the song's always spoken to me because it speaks of these things. He says, one of the lines he says, I hope when you take that jump, you don't fear the fall. Sometimes we don't jump because we fear the fall. One of the lines in the song says, hope if everybody runs, you choose to stay. It's a different mindset. One of the lines in the song is, the only way you can know is to give it all you have. It's the only way you could ever know who you are is to give it all you have. Take a risk. Do things that scare you. And then he says, I hope when the moment comes, you'll say, I did it all. I want to be that person who says that. And I'm working hard towards becoming that person. For the sake of my wife and my children and this church. 1 Peter 1.13, it says, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Prepare your mind. All these things the Bible says to us, renew your mind, set your mind, prepare your mind. These are active things we do. You don't just, you don't just end up with a mind that you have. It is cultivated. It is built. It is determined by your thoughts, your feelings, and your choices. Amen. You're not going to feel like doing the things we spoke of today. You need to prepare your mind to step into the purpose God has prepared for you. We still got time. Okay. Let me quickly share with you what I learned this week of science affirming the Word of God. There's an area of your brain, now it's a big word, it's a big name, I'll just refer to it as the AMCC, amen? You can go study that out. Which is activated when you do things that your mind and body don't want to do. Only then is it activated. Now this area of your brain regulates what energy you give to certain tasks. And this area of the brain also determines willpower, tenacity. This area of the brain has been shown to be especially enlarged in high performance and professional athletes. And development of this area of the brain only happens by doing things your mind and body find undesirable. Like going to the gym, like picking up that weight. What research has shown is that people with a well-developed 
AMCC show better life outcomes in health, achievement, and career. But it is only activated and it only grows every time you do something that is not desired because it's hard. That's why I encouraged us last year to be a church and a people who do hard things. Amen. Who commit to learning something I didn't know. Who commit to changing a lifestyle, to improving our health, to doing things that we find hard but that are good for us. The growth mindset understands that your growth in life is proportional to the challenges you overcome. In order to overcome challenges, you're going to have to face and do challenging things. A growth mindset person embraces challenges, persists in the face of resistance, sees effort as the road to mastery, and learns from criticism. That's why you need a mentor. That's why you need a pastor. That's why you need leadership. Not to criticize you at every turn, but to critique and to show a better way and to guide along the path, to coach, to mentor. We have this example in Jesus Christ who says in Hebrews 12, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of it. Our own Lord and Savior, Jesus, did something that was so undesirable to his mind and his body. And yet for the joy of the result that experiencing that would bring, he brought himself to the place where they would judge him and mock him and ridicule him and spit upon him and beat him and crucify him and kill him. He did a very hard thing so you and I could experience very good things. And in order to of God's pursuit for your life, you need to have the mindset of Jesus who anticipated the resulting joy of enduring sacrifice and giving no attention to the setbacks. To everybody else, it looked like it was the end. It was over. Jesus understood this was something I had to do for the sake of humanity. I had to endure the pain, the suffering, the scourge, the death, so that we could indeed have life and have it more abundantly. Do something this year that your future self will thank you for. Face the nightmares of today so you can live in your dreams tomorrow. Confront what is bad today so you can live in what is good tomorrow. We are saved, set free and redeemed because Jesus faced and overcame the cross. Amen. Do you receive that this morning? Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet as we close off the service. Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around this now. Come on, just you and God. Forget about all the people. Forget about whoever's in this room. Net jy nie jyre volgend. Amal so oor toe. Elke hoof gebuig. No one looking around. Just you and God. Set your mind on Him right now. Set your mind on the word you just heard right now. Because this life I speak of starts by receiving Christ. And I'll say to you the words that Jesus said to the wealthy man, Nicodemus, who came to him at night for fear of what people might think. And he asked him, what is the path to salvation, to eternal life? And Jesus said, you must be born again. And so I say those same words to you, the words of Jesus this morning. You must be born again.
You cannot save yourself. You are not saved because you're a good person. You're not saved by your good works. You're only saved because you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This life I speak of, I spoke of this morning, is only received the day you receive Christ. Your ability to walk in purpose only comes from the one who gives you purpose. Bible says until we meet Christ, until we walk with Christ, everything we've ever done is a dead work. It has no value or meaning. Only when you walk with Christ do you walk in purpose. Only when you receive Christ as Lord and Savior are you saved. You can't save yourself. You're not saved through association. You're not born again because you grew up in a Christian home or because you went to Sunday school religiously or because you attended Christian camps at school. If you never confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in those places, you are not saved. You are only a child of God when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if that's you this morning, you say, Pastor, I want to become a child of God. I want to receive the life that He has for me. I want to become all that Christ has prepared for me. Then I want to pray with you this morning. Another person I want to pray with is, you once lived this life of pursuing God, of living in His house. You once pursued this life of faith. You once served God. You were once found in His church, but for some reason, life happened and you wandered off. You lost yourself like the prodigal son who wasted his life on prodigal living. The Bible says while he was eating with the pigs, he came to his senses. Maybe someone invited you here this morning and you heard this message and I believe God brought you here to bring you to your senses. You realize I cannot continue like this anymore. And if that's you, then I want to pray with you. God loves you. God is for you, is not against you. God wants to help you, give you a new heart, give you a new life, give you a new beginning. But you have to choose. You have to accept Him as Lord and Savior. So all over this place, if that's you, you say, Pastor, I want to receive Christ. I want to be born again. I want to be a child of God. Then I want to pray with you. If you're saying, Pastor, you're speaking to me. I'm that prodigal. I want to come back to my father's house. Then I want to pray with you too. So all over this place, if that's you, you're saying, Pastor, pray with me. You say, Pastor, you prop it my Put with my I feel my sock and I mark my ear. I feel truck come to my father. Then right there where you stand, as believers are praying, every eye bowed, every eye closed. You're saying, Pastor, please pray with me. Just lift up your hand high above your shoulder. Say, that's me. Please pray with me. Look on a work. It's a bit summit, my pastor. Please pray with me. Thank you. I see your hands. Thank you. Come on, my believers are praying. You're standing in this place. You know you're not right with God. You know you're far from God. You know this morning that you need Jesus. Come on, before I pray for people, if that's you, you say, Pastor, you're speaking to me. I need Jesus. Just lift your hand high above your shoulder. Look you on a work and say this act, Pastor, but some of my as a brief. Last the mouth for it for me, a bit. She said this act, I Pastor, but some of my. Look you on a work and say, but some of my as a brief, Pastor. I can hear and work. Thank you, Xenio. Last time. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. It's not too late. If you want to raise your hand, raise your hand and say, that's me. Will you pray for me, Pastor, so I can receive Christ? so I can receive the life that He has for me. If you put your hand up, you can put it down. Look up at me this morning. Many hands have went up this morning. And so right now, I'm going to ask you to do something bold, something brave. Take a step of faith and do something that you might not have thought yourself to ever do. But that's a step of faith. Amen towards the life we spoke of this morning. So if you raised your hand, maybe you didn't, but you wanted to, you want to be included in that prayer, it's not too late. 
So those of you that raised your hands, I want you to take your Bible, your cell phone, your handbag, your personal belongings, whatever you brought to church with you, leave your seat right now. Come to the front. We can pray and agree with you. Come on. Come on, church. Jesus did right. Amen. We all had a day like this. And what I'm going to do right now is going to lead you in a prayer of salvation. This is where you surrender your life to Christ. This is where God extends His salvation to you and you become a child of God. Amen. So put your hand in your heart. Raise your other hand to heaven. And we're all going to pray this prayer together. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I, believe I believe that you are the Son of God. And I believe, I believe that, you died on a cross that you died on a cross for my sins. For my sins. And, I believe and I believe you rose from the grave, rose from the grave on, the third day on the third day to give me life. To give me life. And, I believe and I believe that you have come, that you have come to save me. To save me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I thank you, I thank you that, all my sins that all my sins that I confess to you now, I confess to you now are, forgiven. are forgiven. I thank you, I thank you that, I'm washed in your blood, that I'm washed in your blood, that I'm whiter than, that snow, I'm whiter than snow, that I have a new heart and a new life, and I belong to you, and you belong to me. And you belong to me. And from today, from today I, am a child of God. I am a child of God. Here is my life. Here is my life. Use me for your glory. Use me for your glory. And Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, help me, help me to live the life, to live the life of, purpose of purpose. You've called me to. You've called me to. In Jesus' name, In I, Jesus pray. name I pray. Amen and amen and amen. Amen. Are you guys on the front? We just want to spend a moment with you, have someone pray with you, give you a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, just give you something to read. So if you can do me a favor, follow Tian over there, and we're just going to spend a moment with you in prayer this morning. Come on, church. Let's clap for them. Come on. Heaven's rejoicing. Amen. Amen. While well, it's communion Sunday this morning, so I'm just going to call up Pastor Shaw.